Good afternoon, everyone, and another great episode of Canadians with Disabilities and Their Allies. Today I have Alex Howlett. Um, Alex uh, is going to be coming on the show today talking about consumer monetary theory. Alex Howlett, welcome to Canadians with Disabilities and Their Allies today. Hi, yeah, thank you for having me. So, um, Alex, uh, can you tell um, myself and the listeners what what is consumer monetary theory? Yeah, so it's essentially this term that I came up with to describe how I think about money and how it interacts with people in the economy. And the reason I had to do that is, well, there's two things. One is that people kept thinking I was like an mmt or if you've heard of modern monetary theory. And it's really not that. My thinking is really not MMT. Uh, and then the second problem was that when I told people it was not MMT, they started wanting to call it Howlett monetary theory. Mm. And I thought, well, that's that's not going to work. That's not going to going to yeah. be something that can scale up beyond me or something like that, right? So I had to kind, yeah. of, kind of come up with this other term. And I really like the word consumer because it emphasizes the role of people in the economy as receiving the benefit of the economy, right? The economy kind of, it's, a, it's this machine that produces benefit for people. So our primary role is to be beneficiaries of the economy. So that's why I chose the word consumer. And then money is the thing that we use to access the product of the economy. And my thinking about money is kind of oriented around that. And my, my theory of money is oriented around that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and um, so like how you you came up with that, um, like the terminology of it, um, it sounds quite interesting actually. Uh, like I like to learn a little bit more about it. If you can just kind of dive into that and um, kind of just let the listeners know a little bit more um, on that, that'd be great. Yeah, so I used to be a software developer, and the, this was you know over ten years ago, and I was thinking about you know how nice it would be to not have to worry about copyrights and patents when writing software, right? I could just yeah. you know, use whatever I wanted, make whatever I wanted, that kind of thing. And then I started imagining, okay, well, what would the economy look like if we eliminated those institutions? And in my mind, what I, what I came up with was that, well, the economy would still be capable of producing everything it was before, but a lot of people would lose their source of income. They'd lose their cash flow. So there had to be a way to replace that cash flow. And then that's when I started thinking about what's now called, or even back then it was called basic income. Now it's more called universal basic income. But this idea that you just have this mechanism by which everybody in the economy receives an ongoing cash flow unconditionally, regardless of, you know, whether they're working or, you know, how poor they are, that kind of thing. It's just kind of this default money that goes to everyone. So I started thinking about basic income and then... I realized I didn't really know that much about uh, economics and I had this intuition that something like basic income had to be possible because you had to be able to replace potentially broken money distribution mechanisms in our economy. Initially, I was thinking about copyrights and patents and how that's a way of generating income for people in like publishing industries and, and you know, patent lawyers and, and or patent trolls and all that kind of stuff, Disney uh, media conglomerates. And, you know, it generates income for them and for all their employees and all of that kind of stuff. But there are other things that we do in our economy to generate cash flow for people that are really inefficient. We use economic policy to try to promote full employment. So this is, we're nudging the economy in the direction of giving everyone jobs. And we're doing this not because, oh, we, we want more stuff. We're doing it because we want those workers to have the money or we want people to be workers and to receive money through jobs. But at the end of the day, what this is, is this, this is make work policy. So this is really like, I started on the copyright, patent, intellectual property side of things, or that's what I was thinking about initially. But really the main thing is this kind of make work framework for our economic policy. That, that the way people get their money is expected to be through jobs, so we make up jobs for people indirectly, right? The jobs are created by the market, but we change market incentives to create jobs for people. And basic income is an alternative to that. Instead of forcing people to do useless work as an excuse to pay them, we can hand people money directly. I'm not, I'm not disabled. I don't, I don't think of myself as disabled. Some people might call me disabled, but I don't think of myself that way. But yeah, I don't... More of an ally than, any, than, than anything, right? 
Yeah, well, I want to be an ally to everyone, right? Like, I yeah, want to be an ally yeah. to humanity, and, and there's, this, there's this system that's broken. I like to say that mm -hmm. the way we get people their money is broken, and it's affecting everyone. We look out in the world, and we see some people who are suffering, and we see some people who are very, very rich, which, that, those in are very different circumstances. Yeah, in, in, in Income inequality, for sure. Yeah, we see a lot of income inequality, but the reality is that the way we get poor people their money is broken, but the way we get rich people their money is broken too, yeah, because yeah. We're, we're stimulating the financial sector to generate this money flow to rich people, and that's a broken way of getting people their money too. So basic income can be a very simple, straightforward default way of getting everybody their money, and you don't have to kind of distort markets in order to get the market to create jobs or you know the financial sector to, to get really, really big in order to... you know keep the economy going, that kind of thing. So the way we get everybody their money is broken. So basic income isn't about solving poverty. It's not about helping poor people. It's not even about helping disabled people. It's about fixing kind of a, a fundamentally broken piece of our economic infrastructure. And by virtue of that thing being broken today, it, it causes all these other problems, especially for people who are more vulnerable. Yeah, yeah, it puts more strain on our healthcare systems around the around the world, um, especially yes. in like in, well, in, in Canada and the U.S. and I mean everywhere really. And I mean that's how like this show started out is just mainly we're focusing on you know Canadians and stuff um, and people, but then it, I started expanding out and I have more and more people coming on from different countries now and realizing that the system is broken around the world and yeah um, and um, we need a you know we need a fix and very quickly um, and I'm surprised that like politicians don't seem to have that appetite to want to fix it uh, I mean they know it's broken they just don't want to accept the fact I guess um, what's your what's your view on that my view is that I think a lot of people see that the system is broken but they don't necessarily know how it's broken or how to fix it I think culturally, you know, it's 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 embedded not just in our culture but in our psychology. This idea that everyone needs to contribute in order to in order to just keep society going and that kind of thing. So that the way you get money is through a job, and we create these kinds of exceptions for people we you know kind of put into the category of okay, you're not able to do the bare minimum of whatever. So now we're classifying you as disabled, and but we need you know these kind of work ethic incentives and every everything for everyone else and then we carve off those people and say they're those people we carve off disabled people and say that they're separate in a certain way from the normal functioning of society and and I think that's kind of not the best way to organize things I think everyone you know like I said like the, the consumer is the main role that people have everyone can be a beneficiary of the economy and it's true that you need incentives for certain work to get done and that's all of that is fine, but that's different from saying that everybody needs to do uh, a minimum amount of work or everybody needs to contribute equally. It, it's it's natural that if you create incentives in the economy that some people are just going to respond and work harder than others, or some people are going to be better able to work on certain things than others. And that's all of that is fine. It's fine that some people are working less or some people are not working at all. Like as long as the total amount of work gets done that we need, all of that is fine. So I think we're we're kind of thinking about it at this like individual level of okay we need to get everyone employed we need to get everyone working unless you have an excuse whereas if you start from the other direction if you start from the top down big picture we need a certain amount of work to get done what incentives can we have in place to get that work done and let's give people everything that benefits them not just money but healthcare and and infrastructure and civil protection and legal protection, you know, like all of the kinds of things that you want in a society. Let's give as much of it to pos yeah, you... as possible for people for free. And then you only withhold some amount, you only withhold enough benefit to create an incentive for, for some people somewhere to go out and do some work to earn, to earn the extra that you're withholding for people in general. You give them the, they give them the pie, they basically the whole pie and then they can kind of figure out what they want to do with it rather than saying, well, you can only have a certain part of that pie because you're, you know, part of the, the segregated, um, you know, part of the, the society, like, uh, you know, a disabled person, well, I'm sorry, you know, because you're, you're low income or whatever, which is wrong, right? Because everybody should be able to prosper um, through society. Like, if you give people money 
Alex, like, uh, as an example, you get people money, they're going to put the money back into the community that they live in, right? Or they're going to go and visit another community, and everybody prospers from it. Big businesses right now, they've been making record profits off the pandemic, uh, and it's just distorting all of what we know. Um, I mean, most people have to you know, go to the big businesses, right, to do their shopping, because, I mean, the, <laughs> the small ones are pretty expensive, right? But if you give everybody the amount that they need, they, they can go and make that choice for themselves. They can maybe get a small business going if they wanted to or, or whatever they, they want to use that money for, right? I mean, that's true. But I think it's important to keep in mind that what we care about isn't businesses. It's people. Yeah. Yeah. Businesses exist to serve the people, right? So if you're starting, if you're, if you're creating a policy with the idea of, oh, this will help small businesses, then I think you're doing it wrong, right? And if you're thinking about like, oh, we give give money to people and that puts money back into the community, I don't think that's the right way to think about it either. Like if you give money to people and they choose not to spend it, okay, fine. That just means that there's more room in the economy for other people to, to spend money. The main thing that, that money gives people is it gives people access to the economy's output. If they choose not to use that access, that's fine, right? It doesn't matter how much money people are actually spending, what matters is maximizing the potential benefit that they have access to in the economy. Well, I guess you know, what I mean too is like if, if somebody wants to go, um, if they don't have enough money, they're, you know, they're on a very fixed income. Uh, maybe they're a senior and low income person, person with a disability. Uh, maybe they want to take a public transit where to a longer journey that they normally can't afford to go and take it. Well, now they're using they're putting that money back into the into the community is what I mean. Like like a small business, maybe a, a small business operator, like a, a transit operator, um, or like a like a go train, or if it was Ontario, or I guess that's kind of what I mean too, right? And um, what's your view on that? Yeah, I mean, my view is that spending money does put money back into the community, but that's not important. I mean, basic income can put money into the community. So if nobody's spending money, you can just have a higher basic income, right? It's not like a, a, a beneficial side effect that people are taking trips and spending money in local communities or you know that kind of thing. That doesn't matter. None of that matters if the way you get people money is if you have a direct way of getting people money. Oh, it's always a, a different you know way of looking at it for sure. So, it, like, how is that different? Like, like from like the uh, like say a, a traditional like a UBI or like a basic income, um, like the consumer monetary theory. In comparison, I'm just kind of wondering, like, just so that the listeners yeah. really get a better understanding of that. So consumer monetary theory is just my framework for understanding how basic income works. So when I think about basic income, I'm defining it in the way, essentially the way the basic income earth network does. I don't know the exact wording that they use off the top of my head, but it's essentially an unconditional cash flow that goes to everyone. It's ongoing. So you get a certain amount of money every month or day or week or whatever. But the idea is that you have this just cash flow coming in at all times and everybody does equally. Uh, it's just the, the simplest straightforward way to distribute money to people. That's basic income, also known as universal basic income. These two terms are synonyms for me. I know that some people use the term basic income to describe certain things that aren't universal. That's been more common more recently. When I first got into it, basic income just meant it it's basic in the sense that everyone gets it. The, the definition of basic income from the Basic Income Earth Network has nothing to do with the amount of money, right? It's not enough to meet people's basic needs. It could be less, it could be more. It's a particular mechanism. It's just an even distribution of money. So you can have kind of a debate about what's the best way to get people money. And then you can have a debate about what's the right amount of money to get to people. And these can maybe be somewhat separate discussions. And I certainly tend to focus on the first one, where I would say that an even distribution of money, a universal basic income to everyone, is a really efficient way of distributing money. And that's better than, say, kind of pushing money to people through jobs or stimulating the financial sector. And it's also better than, okay, let's go out into the world and, and try to target and identify, okay, who are the people who really need money and, and push money to them? That is not going to be helpful if the way you get people, like I said, even rich people or even people who aren't poor, if the way we get everybody their money is broken, you know, targeting only the poor people is, isn't going to address that problem. 